I just want to thank and praise Yahweh Almighty, the one who sits high and looks low on me. And I thank him for the opportunity to bring forth the word. I know it's been a blessing to me. Um, My hope today, what I came to do today, through the power of Yahweh's spirit working through me, is to start a fire. I want to start a fire today, saints. So I want to start with this little video before I preach. The video is actually called Start a Fire. Hallelujah. I like this little video because it says so much. It's short and sweet, but to the point, and it says a whole lot. One person, one person on fire for Yahweh can set this church on fire. Amen? And one church on fire can set this community on fire. Amen? And one community on fire can set this city on fire. Amen? How many of you know that in the book of Luke, Yeshua said, I came to bring the fire. He said, I came to bring the fire to the earth. And if you read that passage, he goes on to talk about how he came to divide. He came to divide the sheep from the goats. But when he says that, he said, I came to bring the fire and I wish that it were already kindled. But the fire wasn't kindled at that time. But he came to kindle the fire. What I want to do today, saints, is start a fire. I want you to know that fire is often used in Scripture as a sign of Yahweh's presence and as a sign of judgment, acceptance, and rejection. When Yahweh appeared to Moses, he spoke out of a flame of the burning bush. Later on Mount Sinai, when he appeared to all of Israel, he appeared as fire on the mountain. He manifested himself as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night as he led the children of Israel through the wilderness. When they built the tabernacle, the first sacrifice that was made in the Holy of Holies, Yahweh sent down fire from heaven to consume the offering. When Solomon dedicated the temple, fire fell from heaven. Both Daniel and Ezekiel had visions of Yahweh's throne on fire. John had a vision of a glorified Messiah in Revelation where he described him as having eyes like a blazing fire. Fire is a sign of Yahweh's presence and his positive acceptance. But fire is also a sign of judgment. The same fire that refines one man will consume or destroy another. He sent fire and brimstone raining down on Sodom and Gomorrah, consuming them. Nadab and Abihu offered up strange fire to Yahweh, and fire came out of Yahweh's presence and consumed them. When Israel complained about their hardships in the wilderness, fire burned among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. When the sons of Korah rebelled against Moses' leadership, fire from Yahweh came and consumed 250 men. Throughout the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see the fire of Yahweh. 
John the Baptist said, I have baptized you with water, but there's one coming after me who is mightier, and he will baptize you in the Spirit and with fire. Yeshua came to bring the fire, saints. He came to totally immerse us in the presence of Yahweh. Now, I know you guys remember Beth's message, not the last one, but the one before that, where she was talking about, we have Yahweh in us, but are we in Yahweh? See, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, but are we immersed in Yahweh? That's the fire he came to bring, saints. In Acts chapter 1, he says, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit living in you is the fire of Yahweh that gives you the power you need. It's the spark that sets things off. It gives you the power you need to live this Christian life. He gives you the power to share your faith. He gives you the power to forgive people who have hurt you. He gives you the power to overcome your flesh. In your own strength, you cannot live this Christian life. Yeshua said it himself. Without me, you can do nothing. John 5, 5. But the fire of Yahweh in your heart will be like a spark that generates the power you need to walk this walk. I can do all things through Yeshua who strengthened me. In my own strength, I can do nothing. But in him, I can do all things. That's what the word of Yahweh says. Amen? But I want you guys to understand this. Fire will only keep burning as long as it has oxygen and fuel. If it runs out of either, the flame will go out. Now, Yahweh's eternal, and what he's given us in his Holy Spirit is also eternal. But we have to have a fire started in us. We have to tend to that fire. We have to feed our spiritual man. We have to keep the fire burning. You remember what Yahweh told the priests when they were dealing with the fire in the tabernacle. Let the fire continuously burn. Don't let the flame go out. Every single day, the priests had to tend to the fire. They had to add firewood. They had to arrange the offering. If you don't tend to a fire, it will simply flicker away and burn out. I want you guys to understand that this can happen to us spiritually as well. I came to start a fire, saints. I want you to understand that when you think back over your life, do you remember a time when you were more excited and more fired up about the things of Yahweh than you are right now? Can we think of a time? Now, I'm going to be a little transparent here. I'm going to put myself out there as the example because I've been reflecting on this. You know, I remember when I first got saved. I remember when I first came to the realization that I was a sinner and that my destiny was hell, and that all the wicked, evil, perverse things that I had done in my life, I was deserving of every lick of the flame that I was going to get. You know, I listen to Sister Margaret's testimony today, and I feel you. When I think about the things that I've done in my life, Yahweh was with me even then, before I even knew him, just like she said. All the wickedness and perverseness and evil that I had done, I deserved every lick of the flame that I was going to get. When I came to that realization that I was a sinner, because, you know, I always thought I was a good person. I'm a good person, you know? And when I came to that knowledge, I was grieved. I was like, wow, I'm, I'm destined for hell. <laughs> like, I'm working for the enemy. I wanted Satan soldiers, you know, and, and pretty good at it, too, leading others that way, you know? And then I read the word... I saw example in my husband. I thank Yahweh for Micah because he's always been a good spiritual leader. He's always kept me, you know, focused on the things of Yahweh when I get wayward, you know. Takes it to the word. Look at this. What about this? What about this? But I read the word and I started to see that in my hopeless situation, there was this God. There was this high and lofty one. There was the one who created me, who knew every hair on my head, every thought that I've ever had, every sin that I've ever committed, every nasty, vow, wild, perverse, wicked thing that I've ever done. He knew, and he loved me anyway. And this was an awesome realization to me, 
that this God who I have betrayed and been unfaithful to and denied and rejected and shamed, this God loves me anyway. I was so excited. He made a way for me. I don't have to feel the flame of the fire because he's laying before me glory, hallelujah. I was so excited. I wanted to tell everybody, everybody. I'm out, let me tell you, you're a sinner. You are a sinner. And sinners go to hell. But guess what? Oh, there's this God, hallelujah. There is this God who sits high and looks low on me, hallelujah. And he loves you. He cares about you. And he will forgive you, hallelujah. And he lays before you an option. You can go ahead and march into your destiny, which is hellfire. Or you can have door number two. Glory in heaven, in my presence. I couldn't wait to tell everybody. I mean, I was on fire for Yahweh. You weren't going to have a conversation with me that didn't include sinner in heaven. On fire. And then as I started to grow in the knowledge of the word, read the word more, I started to get a little desperate. Let me tell you something. Yahweh is a God of promises, and he's faithful to his promises. And where the saints can rejoice in that fact, the wicked surely cannot. See, there's a whole lot of promises to those who choose to give their lives over to Yahweh. But there are equally a whole lot of promises for those who reject him. And as I'm reading the scripture and I see, you know, for the people who turn their back on me, the people who deny me, the people who play around with me and mock me, the people who do these things, the flame of fire is waiting them. I started thinking about my loved ones, people I love and care about dearly, people I don't want to think about for one moment suffering in the flame of fire. I got to tell them. I got to go tell them. They need to know. As the desperation takes over me, I don't understand what you got to think about. Fiery hell or glory in the presence of Yahweh. Why can't you get this? What do you need to think about? This is crazy to me. Life or death. What, what do you need to think about? And over time, and I'm sure this happens to all of us, you go out, you witness, you preach, you try to be an example, you show them the scripture. It's so plain to you, but why can't they get it? And you start to get discouraged. You get discouraged. You say, what's the use? They don't get it. They don't want to change. Hell is their destiny. I can't do anything about it. And you begin to witness less and less. You get a little more fearful of sharing this good news because you don't want to be rejected. Nobody likes rejection. Yeshua surely didn't. And you begin to lose your zeal. You begin to keep this thing to yourself. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, don't put out the Spirit's fire. The question is, have we done that? Have we done that? I want you to know that your fire can be distinguished not just from being discouraged by different things, but also from neglect. Yahweh told the priests that it was a daily discipline to keep adding wood to the fire to keep it burning. It's the same for us spiritually. If we want our spiritual man to thrive, if we want our spiritual man to rule in this vessel, if we want to be used of Almighty Yahweh, it is a daily discipline. We must not neglect to feed the fire. We should be in prayer, constantly in communion with our first love, having conversations, seeking his guidance. We should be in our word. That's why it's called the daily bread. Did you know that was why it was called the daily bread? Because you're actually supposed to get in the Word every single day and feed your spiritual man. Getting in the Word is not a Sabbath thing. My daily bread, every single day, in the Word of Yahweh. I should not fail to assemble myself with the other saints. I want you guys to understand something. 
that if you think the church is optional, you're not part of the body. It is not optional for my arm to go where I lead. It's not optional. Wherever my head goes, my whole body goes. It's not optional. If it's optional for you, you're not connected. You are not connected. Everything on me is connected to itself. I can't leave my hand over there. It has to go. It has no choice. Church is not optional. If you fail to assemble yourselves together, as some of us are in the habit of doing, your fire will go out. We need each other. Yahweh has blessed us with different giftedness. But the gifts work together for the edification of the body as a whole. Your gift isn't for you. Your gift is for the body. We need your gifting here. Church is not optional. If your fire goes out and you lose your zeal, you will go from being Yahweh's chosen to being Yahweh's frozen. The fire went out. You're cold, saints. You're complacent. You're apathetic. You're standing still. You're no longer seeking after him diligently. You're no longer progressing towards glory. You've taken a break. That means the fire has gone out. We need to be touched by the fire of Yahweh. Every single person that ever lived, ever since the beginning of time to this present day, every single person, billions and billions of people, every single one will be touched by the fire of Yahweh one way or another. One way or another, you will either be refined and purified and perfected so that you can stand in his presence, or you will be consumed or destroyed because you cannot stand in his presence. The scripture says that Yahweh is a consuming fire and a jealous God. Did you know that we serve a jealous God? Scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 4, if you want to check it out. He's a jealous God. What he desires from us is a true commitment. He wants us to honor him, to respect him, to love him as our God and our king. He wants us to keep ourselves pure for him. Be ye holy as he is holy. He literally wants to be one with us on the most intimate level. But because he's so holy, because he's so pure, he cannot be one with us if we are covered in sin. Because to be in his presence covered in sin, he will consume you. You will be destroyed. And Yahweh loves us. He doesn't want that for us. That's why it grieves him when we are unfaithful. When we are unfaithful, it's not even about him. It's about us. He knows that we're not going to be able to stand before him in our unfaithfulness. He doesn't want any of us to be lost, condemned to the lake of fire. It grieves him. He loves us. And that love is powerful. And when the bonds of love, that oneness, that connection is threatened through unfaithfulness, your passion begins to get stirred up to defend that love. Isn't that true in our human relationships? I expect my husband to be faithful to me. And my husband expects me to be faithful to him. This is not even something that needs to be thought about. That's just what it is. Yahweh's no different. If Micah were to start entertaining some other woman, it would stir jealousy up in me. Let me tell you, jealousy is such a powerful emotion that there is actually a legal defense called crime of passion. That means in a crime of passion, I could kill you and walk away. It's a legal defense, a crime of passion. Because when somebody hurts you like that, and it stirs up all this raw emotion in you, sometimes it manifests itself in a way that you're not even prepared to deal with afterwards. But Yahweh's no different than us. He is not going to tolerate our unfaithfulness. We are called the bride of Messiah, the bride of Christ. Amen? And he doesn't want us playing around with the things in the world. And he doesn't want us straddling the imaginary fence. 
We are either faithful to him or we are unfaithful. We are either his or we are not his. We are either loyal or we are not loyal. But you can't be both. Yeshua is coming for a bride that is unspotted, untainted, unblemished by the world of sin that we live in. He's coming for a bride that has made herself ready, who has prepared her face in the word, who has washed herself in the blood of the lamb, who has clothed herself in the wedding garments of righteousness, all in preparation for the marriage supper of the lamb. The question is, are you ready to step into forever with your God? Have you been faithful? Are your loyalties with Yahweh 100%? Or are you divided? Are you faithful in some things and unfaithful in others? See, I wouldn't accept Micah being faithful to me in some things and unfaithful in others. Because partial faithfulness is what? Unfaithfulness. Today I want you to think about if the fire of your first love, your love for Yahweh, that burning passion, is it still there? Are you like Jeremiah? I got fire shut up in my bones. I got to share this good news. I got to put this, I got to release it. I can't contain it. Do you know my God? Hallelujah. Do you know how good he is? Do you know he loves you? Do you know he made a way out of no way? Or has the flame been snuffed out? For some of us, the flame needs to be rekindled. We've lost our zeal. We've allowed our relationship with Yahweh to become routine. We've taken Yahweh for granted. We've held back from giving him our all. We have been unfaithful brides. We've dishonored his love for us. I want you to know that when you chase after other things and those things become idols in your life and they replace him on the throne of your heart, that is nothing less than spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. The scripture says he is a jealous God, and he's not going to tolerate our unfaithfulness forever. Judgment for sin will surely follow. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16, he says, If you obey the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim, which I command you today, to love Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, then you shall live and multiply. And Yahweh your Elohim will bless you in the land into which you go to possess. But if your mind and heart turn away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish and you shall not live long in the land which you pass over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you that I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the curses. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. Yahweh wants us to keep his commandments to follow in his way, to keep ourselves pure. And when we are unfaithful, we need to seek forgiveness. We need to repent. We need to turn back to him. We need to give him our all, all of our heart, not most of it, not some of it, not part of it, all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, everything. That's what he desires from us. And we need his help. We need him to send his refining fire into our lives to purify us and cleanse us and burn away those things that are not of him. We need to fire saints. So turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to talk about this fire and how we need it. Now I'm going to catch some of you up who may not be familiar with the story and give you a little background. King Ahab was the reigning king in Israel. The scripture says He did more to provoke Yahweh to anger than all of the kings before him. He turned the people from worshiping Yahweh to worshiping a heathen god named Baal. And because of their wickedness, Yahweh closes the heavens for three and a half years. No rain for three and a half years. No rain. Israel is in the midst of a devastating drought. 
There's no fruit on the vine. Terrible famine is plaguing the land. There's no food to satisfy their hunger, no water to quench their thirst. The people are dying. Which brings us to 1 Kings chapter 18, where we find the prophet Elijah emerging from a a three-and-a-half-year seclusion to challenge Ahab, king of Israel. So 1 Kings 18, verse 17. Now, this is an exciting story. And oftentimes, I like to entertain the idea that I was actually there, and I got to watch this, because this had to be like TV for them. This, this was like entertainment. It's like, oh, there's this big battle going on. Let's go check it out, you know? So verse 17, reading from the Amplified. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Are you he who troubles Israel? Elijah replied, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, by forsaking the commandments of Yahweh and by following the Baals. Therefore, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah who eat at the queen Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you halt and limp between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I and I only remain a prophet of Yahweh, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. I will dress the other bull, lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the one who answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and dress it. For you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull given them, dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, oh, Baal, hear and answer us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And they leaped upon and limped about the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he has gone aside, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and has to be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. Midday passed. And they played the part of prophets until the time for offering the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no answer, no one who paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near him. And he repaired the altar of Yahweh that had been broken down by Jezebel. Then Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of Yahweh came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, Elijah built an altar in the name of Yahweh. He made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of sea. He put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water ran around about the altar and he filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Yahweh, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that you, Yahweh, are Elohim and have turned their hearts back to you. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and also licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And Elijah said, seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one escape. They seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and as Yahweh's law required, slew them there. 
And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I lost my spot. (laughs) So what we have here is Elijah challenging Ahab to a showdown. He says, gather together your 450 prophets of Baal and your 400 prophets of Asherah, and let's have a contest. Let's end this today. Let's make it a contest to see who Yahweh, who God really is. Baal, who you serve, or Yahweh, the one true God. You can no longer stand on the imaginary fence. You can no longer halt between two opinions. You can no longer bow to Baal for one thing and bow to Yahweh for something else. You have to choose. I want us to think about for a moment that we have the same choice to make. Every single day, there's a battle raging within you between your flesh and your spirit. They both desire to lead your soul. If you live after the flesh, you will reap the reward of the flesh, which is hellfire. If you live after the spirit, you will reap the reward of the spirit, which is glory with Yahweh. Amen? So we too can no longer halt between two opinions. We must make a choice. And that's basically what this contest is about. He said, we're going to find out once and for all who God is. And if Yahweh is God, follow him. And if Baal, follow him. But choose ye this day. See, the people forgot the commandments of Yahweh. And they started doing their own thing. They forgot that their provision came from Yahweh. And they started praying to Baal to make provision for them. And we have to be careful that we don't fall into the same trap, that we don't forget the commandments of Yahweh, that we don't start looking to things in the world to make provision for us. See, some of us have elevated our jobs above Yahweh. We're so dependent on our jobs or our parents or our money or our status. But what you need to recognize is that Yahweh is our provider, not our job, not our money, not our parents. It is because of Yahweh you have that job. It is because of Yahweh you have that money. It's because of Yahweh you have your parents. Yahweh is your provider, not my husband, not my job. And see, we don't want to lose sight of that fact. We don't want to disregard the things of Yahweh because I got to keep this job. This job is my livelihood. This this job is how I make it. But they want me to work on the Sabbath. Uh, I need my job. I need this money to pay. I need to be taken. Let me tell you something. Yahweh knows what you need. And he got you. He got you. He knows what we need. Amen? Amen? The children of Israel needed something to turn them back to Yahweh because they forgot. They forgot how great he was and how good he was and all the provision he made and all the stuff he did for them. They forgot, and they needed to be reminded. But this is fascinating to me because for three and a half years, there's been no rain, and the people are suffering. Things are not good for them right now. Now, these are people who knew who Yahweh was. You know, they knew who Yahweh was. They heard the stories. They seen some things for themselves. And you would think when they turned their back on Yahweh, when they forsook Yahweh, and they went out into this world, and all this bad stuff started happening to them, you would think that they would have sense enough to go back to Yahweh. You would think they would be like, wow, it was so much better when I was over there. It was so much easier when I was over there. But they don't do that. And it's the same today. We know people who have sat in the church and heard the word of Yahweh preached. We know people who have forsaken him, who have turned their back on him and then gone out and danced with the devil, gone out into the world. And they're struggling and they're suffering and they're going through things they don't even need to be going through. And you would think they would turn their eyes to the hills from which cometh their help. But they don't. They need to be reminded. They need to be reminded that there is a God in heaven, amen. That there is a God who loves them, amen. That he's a faithful God and he will forgive you and he will restore you.
and that there's no sin that you can commit that is too great for him to forgive. Hallelujah. There is no vice that the devil can put on you that Yahweh can't release you from. We need to remind them that there's a God in heaven. We need to remind them that the focus is not on them and their suffering. Their focus is on how do I get myself right with Yahweh? They need to be reminded. They need the teachings that were put in them to be stirred up. They need to be revived. Do you know what revive is? Brought back to life. Hallelujah. Life is in the body of Yeshua. Amen. And when we go out there and we indulge the flesh and we act like the world and talk like the world and dress like the world, guess what? We are the walking dead. And we need to be revived. We need to be revived. What they need is an encounter with Almighty Yahweh. Now, the prophets of Baal go first. I want you to notice that they prepare their altar for worship the same way Elijah did. You know, they put the wood on, they cut up the bull, they put it on her. So they're using the same things for the sacrifice, the altar, the wood, just like Elijah, right? They both will call on the name of their God. They will praise and worship. But theirs doesn't have the same effect as Elijah's. Right? So when that isn't enough, they go further and they start cutting themselves, piercing their flesh, pouring out their blood, you know, crying out to Baal. Baal, Baal, light the fire, send the fire, show yourself, prove this man wrong, show him. And nothing happens. I want you to know that it is possible for us to be supposedly praising and worshiping Yahweh. But when we get done with all of that, the sacrifice is still there. And the wood is still there. Why? Why? Because Yahweh is not impressed with fleshly demonstration. Yahweh knows your heart. He knows why you do what you do. It's not about show. It's not about the outwardness or what other people see. Yahweh knows your motivation. He knows why you do what you do. The 450 prophets are crying out. They're bleeding. They're crying. They're pleading, but to no avail. And usually there's power in numbers. Let's remember there's 450 prophets of Baal against one. 450 against one. Against one. But 450, 450 million. It doesn't matter when the one is Yahweh. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how it looks. Amen. It doesn't matter how many people you got. I serve a mighty God, hallelujah. The odds are in my favor, hallelujah. Line them all up. It only takes one. Almighty Yahweh, amen. So they fail miserably. They fail. And now it is Elijah's turn. And Elijah steps up, man of Yahweh, prophet. And he calls all the people to gather around. And the first thing he does is repair the altar. The altar that Jezebel broke down. He repairs the altar. He had to fix what was broken so it could be used for its purpose. All right now, we likewise need to repair some things in our life. Amen? We need to repair some things so we can receive what Yahweh has for us to receive. You know, we got a lot of stuff going in our life that's our own fault. We got a lot of breaches. We got a lot of openings for the enemy to get in. We got to start professing this word. Speak the word over your life. Amen. Stop that devil down. So Elijah, he calls all the people around. He repairs the altar. He digs a trench around it. He puts the wood on. He cuts up the bull and puts it on. Now, up until this point, Elijah's doing everything, right? But then he commands the people to fill four barrels with water to pour on the sacrifice. And this reminds me of Tony's message. What you got on it? What you got on it? He said, what you going to contribute to this? See, we can't sit idly by and expect Yahweh to pour out his blessing on us. He wants us to prepare to receive his blessing. 
It's like a person sitting at home on the couch talking about, yeah, I'm waiting on Yahweh to give me a job. So while I'm sitting on the couch, I'm not putting any applications in. I'm not making any phone calls. I'm just sitting on the couch waiting for this job to fall from the sky because Yahweh's going to give me a job. Uh, it could work that way because Yahweh's omnipotent. He can do anything. But probably you're going to be unemployed for a long time. That's what I think. Because we need to prepare so that Yahweh can provide. Let me hear y'all say, we prepare, he provides. I said, we prepare, he provides. We prepare, he provides. That's right. See, we know that Yahweh is omnipotent and all-powerful. He doesn't need our help. He could have blew that whole mountain up if he wanted to. But he responds to our actions. Yahweh responds to our actions. We prepare, he provides. Now, I want you guys to understand the significance of this water thing, because this is great to me. It's twofold. It's probably more than twofold, but I only could work with twofold right now. It's twofold. The first thing is, I want you guys to see that water is what they need. Israel is in a drought. Remember? During a drought. And they don't have a lot of water. Water is scarce. And so Elijah's telling them to get water, which is the thing that they need. The thing that they want, that's the thing they need. And he's telling them to pour it on the sacrifice. Pour it out on the sacrifice. Now, here's the first point. We all know that water tends to do what to fire? Puts it out, right? So why in the world is Elijah telling them to douse the wood? Why is he telling them to pour water all over the wood? The wood, the watered down wood won't catch on fire, right? What Elijah's trying to do is show them, make no mistake, when the fire from heaven comes, you're going to know it was from Yahweh. You're going to know it's from Yahweh. I couldn't have did it. The wood was soaking wet. I'm going to show you the supernatural power of my God. Amen? See, we don't just need fire, saints, because we can manifest some fire, right? We need fire from heaven. Hallelujah. And so he wet the wood to show them that. But the thing that they need the most is water. And he's telling them to pour the water on the sacrifice. And I'm thinking about how butt-headed the children of Israel are. I'm surprised they did it, really. You know how how obstinate they are at times? I'm surprised. They probably were like, what? We're we're in a drought. What? What? You know, wouldn't it be enough of a show just to see a lightning bolt come down and light the... Why we got to do that? Like, I'm surprised they did it, but they did it. They were asked to put their most prized possession on the altar of Yahweh. If they wanted to experience Yahweh's fire from heaven, they had to give him the thing that they needed the most. See, they thought that water was what they needed the most, but in actuality, what they needed the most was Yahweh. They needed their love for him back. They needed their zeal, that burning desire to please him. The thing that they valued the most took precedence over Yahweh. And the fascinating thing to me is they gave Yahweh the water they had. And what did Yahweh do? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. What did he do? He opened up the windows of heaven and he poured out the rain. He ended the drought. The very thing that they needed, once they gave to Yahweh, the precious thing that they had, Yahweh blessed them tremendously. Hallelujah. And it's no difference for us, saints. What's the most important thing in your life? What is occupying the throne of your heart? What has become the all-consuming drive in your life? Is it your money? Hmm. Put your money on the altar of Yahweh. And Yahweh will open up the windows of heaven and pour out all the provision that you need. 
Now hear me, I'm not preaching prosperity. I'm not saying sow a seed for 10 and he'll give you 100. What I'm telling you is when you trust Yahweh with your money, when you put your money on the altar, you won't want for anything. All of your needs will be met because Yahweh is our provider, not the money. How about your children? You want your children? You want your children to be seated in heavenly places with you? You want your children there? Then put your children on the altar of Yahweh. Give them to him. Give them to him. And he will pour out a blessing in their lives. Give them to him. See, I want you parents to understand. We cannot police our children's walk. They got to choose Yahweh for themselves. They got to have an encounter with Almighty Yahweh. They have to know that Yahweh is real. And sometimes because we love our kids so much and we don't want to see them go down the path of destruction, we interfere with what Yahweh's trying to do in their lives. We try to rescue them. But if I can rescue you, what do you need Yahshua for? You got me. We got to get out of the way, saints, and let Yahweh have his way with these kids. Yes, we have a charge to teach them, to lead God and direct them in the word, in the way of Yahweh, to model it for them. But they have to choose. A lot of times our kids have our faith. They need to have their own faith, their own faith. So if you want your kids, put them on the altar of Yahweh. Whatever it is that you're holding back from him, Whatever part of your life you haven't yielded to him, give it all to him. And let his fire come down and consume you. Hallelujah. In verse 36. And at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Yahweh, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God. In Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things according to your word. Elisha wants these people to know that everything that he has done is because Yahweh told him to. He doesn't want them looking to him like he's a God, like he's so special, he's so great, he's so powerful and wonderful. He's pointing to Yahweh. He's giving the glory to the Most High where it is due. He's letting them know it is all about him. All these preparations. The sacrifice, the altar, the wood, the water, all of this is a picture of what has to happen in our lives if we want to truly worship Yahweh. The sacrifice, of course, points to Yeshua. He's our sacrifice. The wood represents the cross, Calvary, the place where he suffered for your sin. The altar being repaired is a symbol of us coming back to Yahweh. Repentance, brokenness, turning around. Returning to him in faithfulness and making him our first love again. The water being continually poured out as a symbol of the washing by the word of Yahweh that continually flows through our hearts and our minds, purifying us, cleansing us from the things that this world that are not sanctified. And then comes the acknowledgement that if Yahweh if, if, if all these things didn't come to pass, Yahweh wouldn't have brought the fire. Preparation was necessary. Without the anointing or the sacrifice or the cross or the altar, Yahweh will not move. You want to get to Yahweh? You must go through Calvary. You must go through Calvary or you can't get to him. When all righteousness and obedience to the word of Yahweh is fulfilled, then shall the fire fall. I want you to know that there's coming a day. Verse 39, it says, When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. There is coming a day, saints, when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Yahweh. He is God. It does not matter what they shout right now. It does not matter what they believe right now. In that day, no one will doubt, but it will be too late for most because their belief at that point will only serve to condemn them further. You know what that means? 
That means when the realization that all of the teachings they received and heard are true, when he cracks the sky and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, yes, he is God, he is God. The realization that I didn't listen. Oh my God, it was the truth. I'm sorry now, forgive me, help me. It's too late. It's too late. So their belief at that point will only serve to condemn them further. Every soul that defies Yahweh, every soul that denies Yahweh or is unfaithful will be destroyed in the eternal flames of his wrath. No one will escape it. Each one will be brought down and cast in never to come out again. But for those of us who have prepared ourselves those of us who are the bride of Yeshua, those of us who are making ourselves ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb, those of us that are faithful and true, we will reign with him forever in the glory of heaven. Hallelujah. We will receive a crown of life, a crown of righteousness, a crown of glory, and we will be joint heirs with Yeshua and dwell in the presence of Yahweh forever. We need to fire saints. If you've allowed your flame to flicker out, there's hope for you. Yahweh's a faithful God, hallelujah. Whatever we need, he's faithful to give us. Let him know you want the fire of heaven to penetrate your heart, that you want to be refined in his fire, purified and perfected. You want to be purged of all of this stuff. You want a release of all the things that bind you. We need to repair, rebuild, restore, reclaim, rethink, replenish. We need to re, 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 right? We need revival, hallelujah. We need to be brought back to life, hallelujah. We don't want a dead church, hallelujah. We want a church on fire for the most high, hallelujah. And all it takes, all it takes, saints, is one saint on fire to light this whole church up. One saint on fire. Let me tell you something. If this is you, and you got no fire in your life, and you don't have the glow of being in the presence of Almighty Yahweh, when you come into contact with other people, nothing happens. Nothing. 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 But if you are on fire... You will impact people. You will affect people. You will draw people. Let me tell you something. When there's a huge fire, what do people do? Do they run away from the fire or do they run to the fire? They run to the fire. Unless they're in it, they run away from it. But if they ain't in it, if they ain't in it, they run to the fire. Fire fascinates people. They want to watch. They come to it, big crowds. When you see fires on television, you see big crowds of people just standing around for hours, just watching them fight the fire. Well, guess what? When you got the fire of Yahweh burning in your life, hallelujah, and it's manifested outwardly, hallelujah, it's going to draw people, hallelujah. They're going to want what you got. They're going to be like, I don't know what that girl got, but I want some of that. I want that in my life. I want that kind of hope, that kind of faith, that boldness. I want that. But if you're walking around here with no fire, dead, dragging, complaining, murmuring, woe is me, boo-hoo, who's drawn to that? Who wants that? Nobody wants that. People want the fire that you have. Let's get on fire, say Hallelujah. Back of the book, 